Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship. I feel like we are kind of flying in here by the seat of our pants a little bit more than usual. So uh, I invite you to come on in and sit down. And while you're doing that, I want to welcome anyone who's worshiping on our YouTube channel. It's good to have you plugged in with us this Sunday morning. Everything you need will be on your screen, liturgy, hymns, and more. So just stay tuned and follow along. As we have been doing, I invite us to begin our worship service by reminding ourselves about our OPC mission statement. So if you will participate with me, uh, because here at OPC, we are called and encouraged to invite in all people to constantly discover the love and grace of Jesus Christ. We are called and encouraged to build up one another in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, encouraging everyone to discern and use their gifts and we are called and encouraged to send out empowered disciples to our community and the world to share God's love in word and deed and to relieve suffering in Christ's name. Amen. A few announcements I want to make sure we get through, and then I'm going to invite Sandy Denny forward to tell you a whole lot more about that new little free pantry out in front of the church. Uh, but first, to say uh, some words of reminder that we do have some very awesome Sunday school programs going on right now in the 930 hour. So if you have not already been attending, you are invited to do so. We had a great class today in the Life's Third Act uh, by, about falling and balance and so forth. And so uh, I know that that class will continue to be wonderful and informative. So please attend if you can. And again, during that time, the children are meeting in the art room for play and pray. Uh, with Kaylee and some volunteers, so please make sure you bring your entire family if you can. Coming up, this Thursday, Lily Pads continues. So 10 o'clock in the morning, this coming Thursday, uh, they meet in the back right, which is your back left, as you are sitting facing me. Thank you also for uh, leaving that circle alone so that they can continue to meet without having to set up every single week or change things around. Uh, and. Uh, Again, if you aren't already attending, please do so. I know that they've got a great crowd of around 20 or so. Words about mission opportunities. You've had a couple of emails now uh, land in your inbox inviting you to consider registering for the Appalachia Service Project mission trip that's coming up this July, the first full week of July. It does include the July 4th holiday, so maybe if you're a professional and you need to think about taking time off from work, that can help you because you wouldn't have to take that day as vacation. You get that as a holiday. But July 3rd through 9th is the trip. If you are interested in going, then register using the email that you have been sent, or there's a link in my weekly message each week to, to access it as well. It's uh, $325 per adult. Youth are free to go. If you need assistance, let me know or talk to Jason Roberts as well. One other thing that doesn't have a slide before Sandy comes forward is that prime timers will meet in a couple of Fridays on uh, let's see, what is it, Friday, February 11th, uh, they're going to have some Tex-Mex food. So if you uh, like tacos or enchiladas or queso, not cheese dip, as some, so many restaurants call it, then I invite you to contact Becky McCaskey. Uh, Becky, wave your hand so everybody knows you're at. If you want to RSVP in person today, otherwise you can email her. They're going to have uh, Taqueria La Perilla in two Fridays. So uh, be there or be square. Sandy, I invite you now to come forward. She's going to have several slides to share with you. So stay, uh, listen up and learn more about this little free pantry. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. I am Sandy Denny, and I've been asked to do the uh, mission moment today. And it's a little bit more than a moment. So I appreciate you paying attention and learning a lot. <clears throat> We're tagging on to what he just covered, which was that um, OPC is a tithing church, and we participate in many missions. I'll start with some scripture from Matthew 25 and also remind you where Matthew 25 church. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. This is the word of God. OPC invites in and welcomes. And part of how we invite in and welcome is by supporting the community through various mission efforts many which are food and shelter focused. And that's what we're going to concentrate on today is the food and shelter focus. Did you know that, look at there, he's catching up with me, great, thank you. Did you know that um, this is based on a 2019 study, food insecure people in Oconee exceeds 3,000 people, 
food insecurity rate in Oconee is greater than 8%. You may be asking, what is food insecurity? Food insecurity is the state of being without reliable, sufficient amounts of nutritious, affordable food. Um, <clears throat> many people may not qualify for food programs and food assistance programs, or they may be in temporary situations where they need some help in a gap or in between jobs or something like that. Many people are making choices about, do I put gas in my car so I can get to work tomorrow? Or do I get some more groceries and feed my kids and family? So these are some examples of what food insecurity might mean outside of what you just think. Oh, it's poverty and you know they need help with food. Um, OPC supports acts. And as I was preparing for this project and we put the pantry outside, um, a lot of people started asking me about acts and they wanted to know more about it. And they said, well, Patty makes announcements about acts, but for some of us, we don't really know what that is. And so I, they asked me to include a little bit more about it. So um, I'm gonna do a little bit more of that. Um, Patty coordinates our volunteer, Patty Brunson, and I think she's here today, wave Patty. She coordinates our um, rotating visits. Acts is area churches together serving. And this started many, many years ago where the churches all got together and said, we gotta do something for the people in our, our community and our county that are hungry. It's a 100% non-government funded project. So there's very few rules. People just have to be referred by either a church or a school system or a civic organization or something like that. And we have forms here in the office that if you know someone that might qualify, you can get a form and Sherry can sign off on it. The other requirement is they do have to prove residency in Oconee County. The other thing that um, acts that we do at Acts, our church, is on Thursday morning, there's a crew of five that um, show up from nine to about 10 or 11, unpacking food that Trader Joe's donates and sorting through that. And um, Phyllis, uh, she handles that. Phyllis is waving. She coordinates that. Right now we could use an extra set of hands or two because if we have more hands, then um, we can get that done pretty quick. Um, Axe serves about 200 families monthly but pre-pandemic. 200 families monthly pre-pandemic. I bet that surprises some of you. We also support another program, um, which is called the Kids Food Program, or um, it's through the um, Oconee Area Research Program. And Rose Marie heads that up for us. There she's waving over there. And this is where 10% of school-aged children are served food through that program. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in this church with helping to meet those Matthew 25 goals of feeding the hungry and serving the poor and helping to put an end to poverty. Um, the OPC Garden contributes fresh food to Acts during our seasons, and they're so excited and impressed with how many wonderful things come from our garden. And think about it, it's more than food that comes from that garden. There's a lot of love that goes into that. We also support Our Daily Bread, which is kind of a soup kitchen type project. I don't know who's coordinating that these days. Is that Julie still or? Yeah, yeah. okay, Julie. And then we already talked about Oconee Food for Kids. Um, it's interesting talking about Axe. I was over there this week and we were talking about, people say, well, what do we do when we go to Axe? Well, you can assemble groceries and grocery bags that the clients will come in and take out. Um, you can check dates and sort through things. And we were talking about how many cans of food were in this building and how many hands had touched the cans. And every hand that touches a can is a touch of love from God. Now think about that just a minute. And if you ever go over there, and Patty's nodding her head, and you see all those cans and you just start thinking about it in terms of God's love and God's ministry, on every hand that touches that can. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So it can, you can get excited working over there. Now let's talk about the little free pantry. Did you see it? 
Have you seen it? Is it visible? It is very visible. We haven't even advertised it yet except for on the um, newsletter. And I think EJ put it on the Facebook page. And so it's already gotten a lot of support just bubbling up. And that's sort of the point of it. A lot of people want to know, well, what is it and how does it work? Oh, we have a picture up. That's Jason and Dallas planting it, is what I call it, planting it in our ground. And I need to share with you that we commissioned Dallas to build this for us, and he did a wonderful job. And we have the best and the biggest pantry of all the ones that I'm going to tell you about. And we were able to pay for um, building this pantry through the generous donations of two of our mission part, two of our mission congregants, and also um, Home Depot gave us hundred dollars worth of materials. So we were able to pay Dallas without having to dip into any of our uh, mission funds. And he did a great job at a really reasonable cost. So a little bit more about what a Little Free Pantry is. Um, Little Free Pantries were inspired by Little Free Libraries. And it's a mini pantry that launches a, launched a global movement. It's a physical space and an idea which neighbors crowdsource the pantry with personal care items available to anyone, anytime, no questions asked. Through the many pantries, neighbors help neighbors. All are invited to take what you need and give what you can. Little Free Pantry's real value, though, is in the ability to engage and bridge the empathy gap. Now think about these words. Little Free Pantry asserts our communities actively choose engagement, empathy, and trust. And that given an opportunity, this is who we really are. Neighbors who help neighbors because we all have needs that sometimes cannot be met on our own. So that's the essence of how Little Free Pantries began. Now, <clears throat> I like to think about what more does the Little Free Pantry give right here at OPC. Again, we talked about it's an extension of our Feeding the Hungry and Fighting Poverty mission. Private, no qualifications required. You can roll up. They don't, people don't know if you're putting something in or taking something out. Every member of this congregation can participate regularly. When you roll by that pantry, something should click about hungry people. And when you grocery shop, pick up a few extra cans of soup, some Cheerios or something like that. Put it in your car, and if there's space in the pantry, put it in the pantry. If there's not, keep it in your car until the next time you roll by the pantry, and then put it in there. That's one way we can help all the time and be reminded constantly that it's important to think about our neighbors. It is a visible OPC community outreach service right here on our campus. Now when people come by and they see that pantry, they know one thing about us. We care about the hungry. We care about the community. So I think that's a wonderful part of it. We already talked about the, coast, the cost. This is only the second one in Oconee County. The first one is located at the ESP parking lot. And this is only the second in Oconee County. So where are the other ones? Well, there are um, nine others scattered around Athens and uh, Clark County. Like I said, only two in Oconee. There's, this map is out there. And um, I had to pencil in us because whoever made this, I don't, you know, we just got ours. Um, you can take one of these. If you're interested in this project and you want to learn more and you want to help feed other pantries or feed people through other pantries, then there's a map for you. There's also some additional information <clears throat> out on the mission table about ACTS and what kind of food items ACTS need and how to go about doing those things. There's also some more information about the pantry and you're welcome to pick those things up. And Rosemarie, who by the way is a um, registered dietitian, put together this little basket for us. And this is an example of the kinds of foods that you might want to put into the pantry. You can put other things as well. We want to focus on nutritious foods, but you know, a pound of hamburger and hamburger helper or macaroni and cheese will go a long way when you're stretching a dollar or two. So um, she's got some examples of that in there and it's, you know, it includes things that kids will eat because it won't nurture them if they won't eat it. <laughs> so, so we've got that as well. And we'll move this basket out there, um, you know, at the end of this um, worship service today. 
Uh, these are some other items you can put in the pantry, personal care items, wipes, sanitizers, and these. When you go out and eat and they give you these or you pick it up and bring it home, they give you these, start saving them and put them in the pantry because that helps people as well. Especially if you've got homeless people who don't really have a place to store utensils and prepare food and that kind of thing. And we have already had people utilizing our pantry. Um, I've, I started stocking it and a few other people have been stocking it and I come by and it's starting to empty out from day to day. So um, I think it was Pat McCaskey said, well, the bird will find the feeder. So we need to spread the word and help all the birds find the feeder that OPC has placed right here on our campus. So praise God for y'all, for all that y'all do to help feed the hungry. Thank you, Sandy. You're welcome. Wonderful, wonderful. That is the news of the day, and it is good, good news. So I invite you now to stand in body or in spirit and let us join our voices together so that we can call ourselves to worship on this last Sunday of January. Thinking we know all the answers, yet wondering if we haven't missed something. We enter this sanctuary in search of truth, in the company of friends standing by folks of deep and abiding faith. We gather as God's people and lift our voices in praise. Praise the Lord. Together, let us worship God. Please be seated. Sisters and brothers, God calls us to name our failings and our hopes so that we can be pardoned, healed, and strengthened. Now let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Let us pray together, saying, We do not love as you do. We are attentive with our affections and cautious in giving care. We guard the lines that separate us from others instead of seeking to overcome them. Teach us your boundless love and infuse us with your mercy that we might live more faithfully and love more freely. Through 
Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the God who makes us and knows our every thought hears us now and forgives us of our, all our sin. The peace of Christ be with you. As God's forgiven people, you are invited to take a few moments to extend Christ's peace to one another. I'd like to invite our children to come forward at this time and join me for a time with our younger church. I'm going to scoot down one. Good morning, friends. How are you? Good. It is good to see all of you. Have you had a good morning? Yes? Well, I have a question. Do you guys ever have a mess at your house? All the time? Me too. Yeah? And what kind of things make your mess? Like my new mommy toys. That's your toys? Because there's a whole lot. A lot of new toys, yeah. I thought, like, I think, like, a million, trillion, gazillion Hot Wheels. A million, trillion, gazillion Hot Wheels. Yeah? What else is in your mess? Your dog's toys. Yeah, your Barbie toys. Well, my mess at my house usually looks something like this. That's a mess, huh? Some chopsticks and some ice cream boxes. Some paper. I got a shoe. I got a dog toy, too. Yeah. Do you ever see a mess at church? If you look around the sanctuary, does it look very messy? No, not really. And sometimes it's hard to clean your mess up all by yourself, right? Will you guys help me clean my mess up? Can we put it back in the bag? Yes, you can hold the paper. That's fine. And look how fast we clean up when we all help each other. Oh, thank you. Yep. Can we stick it back in the bag? It's to clean up the dog hair because that's in my mess. Yeah. Well... Sometimes, if the sanctuary and church always looks so clean, then it doesn't feel like we can bring our messes here, right? And sometimes our mess is made of our stuff, and sometimes we feel a little messy inside. Have you ever felt a little messy inside? No? Maybe your emotions, your hurt, or you're scared, or you have something inside that you don't know how to deal with. And sometimes we feel like we have to hide that. But in our story today that Pastor Stephen is going to share, there was a man that came to church with his mess, all of it. And Jesus was there. And Jesus said, that's okay. I'll help you clean it up. 
And so whether it is a mess of our stuff or if we feel a little messy inside, Jesus says, that's okay. Bring it with you. Bring it to church and all of your friends here and everybody that is here to teach you and to be with you will help you clean up those messes. How cool is that? So next time, if you have to bring your mess with you, that's okay. Bring it and ask for help, and we will take care of it together. Sound good? All right, let's lead our congregation in our blessing. Ready? They'll repeat after us. God the Father, bless us. God the Son, help us. God the Spirit, keep us. Now and evermore. Amen. So be it. Amen. Thank you, friends. See you guys later. Amen, and thank you, Kaylee. What a wonderful message for our children and for all of us. As we approach God's word this morning, I invite you to pray with me. Holy Spirit, your people call out for understanding. Bring to our yearning hearts and our yearning minds the truth of your word this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it, and let all God's people say, Amen. I'm going to share just one short passage with you this morning from Mark's gospel. It comes from the first chapter, verses 21 through 28, the story that Kaylee referenced about Jesus uh, casting out the mess that the person brought with them to synagogue. The gospel writer records that Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum immediately on the Sabbath Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. And the people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. And suddenly there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. And the unclean spirit shook him and screamed, and then it came out. Everyone was shaken and questioned among themselves, what's this? A new teaching with authority? He even commands unclean spirits, and they obey him. Right away, the news about him spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray again. Holy God, your blessings are abundant and your wisdom exceeds our grasp. Fill us with your spirit as we ponder your word this day that we may follow you and share your life among all God's children, walking humbly with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray and let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to trivialize this, but for the most part, attending church on Sunday mornings doesn't require a whole lot of effort on your part. It's a very passive experience, if you know what I mean. I see you sitting there. And I'm not even talking about what it's like to worship in a virtual environment because of a pandemic where you can stay home and hold that tasty cup of coffee 
and not get out of those comfy PJs and sit on your favorite sofa and watch or watch from where you are sitting now. So what I mean is, for those of you here especially, once you drive down Hog Mountain Road from whichever direction and turn into the driveway and come around to the side or the back, you park your car, you come inside through one of three different doorways, and you park yourself right where you're at right now. The biggest act of commitment seems to be just getting here. And people come here for a variety of reasons. For example, some people come to church on Sunday morning because it's Sunday. And Sundays have long since been associated with coming to church, similar to how on Mondays our minds click and we wake up and go to school or go to work or go to the gym or go to the golf course or whatever it is you like to do on Mondays when the weather's nice. Other people might come to church on Sundays out of sheer habit alone, as if it's part of your regular uh, daily, weekly, monthly routine that you've been doing for so long that it's hard for you to consider doing absolutely any different. And on top of that, maybe you know uh, that no matter how sleepy or weary you feel from last night or from the week that has transpired, no matter if you feel slightly irritable because you didn't get enough coffee this morning, no matter how hungry you may be because the small breakfast you had isn't holding up as much as usual and it's still a little bit of time before we get to lunch. No matter if you bickered with your kids this morning or you argued with your spouse or you're frustrated for some other reason, regardless of any of that stuff, you've actually been looking forward to the peace and the sense of refreshment that you receive by attending a worship service. And now that you're here, if you haven't already done so, you can sit back and relax and go with the flow, right? Or maybe you come to church because it's how you were raised. That's less and less so, I'll confess. Uh, but for many of us, the expectation was set long ago by our parents or our grandparents or by some other family member that uh, on Sunday mornings you get up. And then you put on your Sunday best, and you go to the church, and you worship God. Oftentimes, coming to church comes with just a little bit of prodding by a family member or a parental unit. So I'm quite aware that um, most, if not all, of the younger folks here this morning, when I say younger, I mean those without a driver's license, didn't necessarily choose to come here and sit here and do what we are doing now. And I get it. Trust me, I get it. Because as I stand here right now, I can hear my mom's voice. She loved to tell me, oh, oh, you're tired, you feel, you feel sick. That's fine, you can stay home. You don't have to go to church today, honey. But, if you're too tired and too sick to go to church, then I'm afraid to tell you that you're too tired and you're too sick to go outside and play later. You're too tired. Remember, you're too sick to play with your friends this afternoon like you always like to do. You're going to have to stay inside. You're going to have to sit here and watch TV shows with me. Cue the eye rolling. I'm sure many of us have heard that as kids or said something like that or similar to our kids or somebody else's kids. Indeed, there are probably many reasons why you came here today, specifically, especially on a fairly cold winter day. But like I said earlier, the point is that you came at all or that you're watching at all. And now you are here in this moment following the flow of a worship service. <clears throat> and now I want you to realize that, believe it or not, nothing much has changed in a couple thousand years. 
back in Jesus' time going to synagogue on the, the Sabbath had similar implications and complications. People largely went out of habit or a sense of routine uh, or expectation or obligation or a combination thereof. Like us, they, they went and they relaxed and they followed the flow and they risked being lulled into complacency. Perhaps the scribes and the Pharisees and the rabbis and the legal experts who provided the weekly lesson on the laws of Moses weren't all that engaging. I mean, after all, if we're not careful, if I'm not careful, then reading parts of the first five books of our Bible on a regular basis will probably be as exciting and engaging for you as if I was standing here reading a kitchen appliance instruction manual. There's a lot of dry stuff in there. And going even further back in time, before the time of the synagogues, God's people didn't necessarily travel uh, to Jerusalem to go to the temple for worship and sacrifice with any sense of excitement uh, or imagination either. They went because they were taught to go. They went because they were told to go and do it. They went because it was expected of them per the laws written in their scriptures, our Old Testament. And they went because all the information available to them at that time and place said this, do this, 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 and that, and then maybe God will be happy with you. Maybe you'll be on God's good side. And so God's people did it, and they went with the flow, and they kept going with the flow, and they never could get it. In most ways, the reason why I'm preaching this sermon today is that we still can't get it either. From Moses to the modern day, prophets and preachers have been too often uh, focused on Uh, making God's word seem like information overload, holding it over our heads like it's going to beat us down. And we've been too focused on, on the words and the delivery and the flashiness of it rather than the message itself, which Sandy so wonderfully delivered this morning already. And so we still all too often miss the point that God wants to transform us rather than bore us. That God wants to create a sense, a reality of transformation in each of us, in this congregation, within this community, within this entire world. Instead, we just keep going through the motions and following the flow week in and week out, virtual or in person. And it's not that God didn't try. It's not that God didn't put forth just a little bit of effort. God tried to help us in lots of different ways and through lots of different people, trying to spark a relationship with us. God established covenants. And God sent prophets. And eventually God realized that it was going to take something much, much more. And then God did the most incredible thing in history once God realized that God could not bridge the gap between God and us with a covenant alone or or with a list of rules or through the voice of a prophet. God took things to a whole new level. And since we are still not that far away from Christmas, we have to remember that God became flesh and dwelt among us. That God sent God's son into the world so we could focus less on the words and the delivery and instead focus more on receiving the message itself. To see God's will and purpose made real through every breath that Jesus breathed, through every step that Jesus took, through every act Jesus did that shook and shocked the world. 
And Mark's gospel was written to tell us all about this Jesus that came to shake things up and change our flow. I just read a small piece from chapter 1, but Mark's gospel is written for people like us. It's written for people like us who believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. Just like those who believed in him immediately following his death and during his life. In fact, it was written with a sense of immediacy, partly because people uh, were so excited that they wanted to share it. They were in a hurry to spread Christ's message. It was like, it was like a hot potato in a good way. They wanted to pass it on, and they wanted those people to pass it on to the next person and so on. As with today's passage, immediately is one of Mark's favorite words. He uses it three more times than Matthew or Luke. Mark uses the word immediately 15 more times than the Gospel of John. Regarding Mark's gospel, pastor and writer Frederick Buechner once said, Jesus himself races by, scattering miracles like rice at a wedding. Mark is alive with miracles, especially healing ones. And Jesus rushes from one to another because he had no time to lose. Compared to the other Gospels, Mark's Gospel is far shorter, and Mark leaves a whole lot of stories out. But Mark does notice the small details. Mark seems to, to see Jesus in a unique way, better than others do, just like Jesus sees each and every single one of us, kind of like Kaylee was talking about with the children. Jesus notices the small details in our lives that no human eye can detect. Indeed, as in the gospel stories, Jesus stops and takes notice of each and every one of us and invites us all to follow him into a whole new world. So think again why you came to church today. Think about why you come to church at all. Like the synagogue in Capernaum in today's reading from Mark, today is just another normal Sunday. There's nothing special that we're celebrating after the sermon. There's no sacrament. There's no extra liturgy. It's just regular, if you will. But in Mark's story, regardless of how ordinary it may seem, Jesus walked in those doors, and God was with them in a unique way, a whole new way. And God in the flesh began to teach with an authority they had never seen. This Jesus of Nazareth had a moral gravity to him, a substance to him that, that people couldn't quite put their finger on. But somehow they sensed that this man and, and his message uh, were more than just refreshing. They were invigorated in a new way that day. And, and actually, if by chance in the synagogue they had bulletins, I can imagine them writing, did you see that? Wow, in all caps, showing their neighbor, passing it back and forth. I imagine them scratching their heads, especially after showing his power to transform through his interactions with that man that day. The people were amazed, and they were probably scraping their jaws up off of the synagogue floor before they could leave and go outside for coffee and fellowship. They had encountered God with us, Emmanuel, remember? And they would never be the same again. They were changed. They were transformed. They were shaken. And they were changed forever. And that's just it. This short story about Jesus in Mark's gospel sums up Jesus' whole ministry and what it's about. One word. Transformation. It's about being shaken and changed. It's about releasing people from whatever binds us, from whatever our mess is, as Kaylee talked about. 
from whatever keeps us from living life as full participants in God's kingdom, whether it be social expectations or peer pressure or embarrassment or some sense of shame or doubt or despair. You name it. It doesn't really matter. Jesus doesn't care. Jesus doesn't care at all what it might be, what our messes might be. Jesus loves us regardless. He comes into our lives without asking. Sometimes Jesus shows up as an interruption, if you will, and yet loves us completely no matter what. It may shake us up. Being, being transformed and changed tends to feel like that. And you know what? It should. It should. You see, Mark's gospel puts us on notice that the scriptures aren't just full of, of anecdotes and information and stories for our amazement or our amusement. From chapter one and going forward, we know that this boundary-breaking, demon-dashing, law-transcending God in the flesh has arrived in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And he expects of his followers far more than simple amazement. So when we come to church each week or worship virtually, and we gather to encounter this Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Holy One of God, as it said in the scripture this morning. May we be tempted, truly tempted, to bust out of our habits, to bust out of our routines, and to bust out of our expectations that might put God in a box. May we resist the urge, no matter how comfortable the chairs may be or your sofa may be at home, to just sit back and relax and go with the flow. And may we all remember that here in this place, just like that synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus comes in those doors and Jesus stops and takes notice of each and every single person here today or watching on our YouTube channel. And Jesus invites us to follow him into a whole new world. So, if we don't leave here sometimes feeling somehow shaken and changed, then shame on us. Because we aren't letting God into our hearts. Thanks be to God for loving us so much that God doesn't want us to stay the same. Amen? Amen. 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 I invite you to enjoy a moment of meditation and when the music begins to stand and body your spirit. Thank you. 
Now as you remain standing in body or in spirit, let us join together and affirm our faith using the words on your screen. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals divine love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful men and women. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of God's love. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our time of concerns and celebrations, we'll refer you as we do every week to our prayer list. You can find that printed on the back of the bulletin handouts that you have this morning, as well as emailed to you twice a week. Remembering all of those things that are shared and unshared, let us turn to God in prayer. Slow us down, Lord. In this day of super speeds, instant actions, and split-second decisions, it is easier to react than to think of reasons and consequences. Slow us down that we may see the faces behind the figures that we may hear the cries beneath the noise of busyness, that we may feel the anguish and frustration so often masked by the deceptive rituals of survival. Slow us down, Lord, that our hearts may grow in dedication to the things you have shown us to be good. Let our hearts beat with the determination of Jesus' inexhaustible fortitude. Let the warmth of our hearts give us the mercy and compassion that sustain the disciples in faith. Let our hearts continually renew our strength through the cleansing power of your spirit. Slow us down, Lord. For sometimes our zeal and preoccupation with solutions causes us to lose sight of your purpose and intent. Too often we rush in to help before taking the time to understand. Too often we invest without caring. Too often we condemn without knowing. Clarify our vision of what can be and lead us in paths of justice and righteousness to the greater good that is your way. Bless the mission of your church, Lord, and bless those who are involved in that mission. Bless our partnership with the poor. Bless our work for peace. Bless our fight for justice and the establishment of your kingdom. Slow us down, Lord, so that as humans, we may know that we are not the sole reason for creation, so we may live with an awareness of others, other people, other places, and other things. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, not because we have to, but because we are grateful, let us return to God what is ours to share. Let us joyfully offer our time, our treasure, our commitment, and our prayers.
For the gifts that are offered this morning and every day to this community of God, let us pray. We thank you, God, that you have blessed us with an abundance of gifts for the flourishing of your world. May this offering of our life and labor reveal your love as we seek to share your promised reign with all creation. Amen. Quick words of thanks to uh, several, to Joel and Austin in the AV booth who make this technology possible that people can watch on our YouTube channel, to Angela and Dallas and all those in the choir who led music for us this morning, to Kaylee for assisting in leading worship, to Margie for being a good liturgist as always, and to all of you for being here in person to worship together and to those of you who are watching and worshiping on our YouTube channel. Uh, come back each and every week if you can and know that you are invited to be here in person if you so choose. Now, my friends, as we go from this time of worship to face the joys and challenges of the coming 
hours and days ahead. Let us remember that we are all called and commanded to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So go. Go and fill that little free pantry. Go and love the people you meet this week and next. Go and uh, be a good neighbor. Practice kindness. Be generous and be humble and build bridges with people. Forgive your enemies. Seek justice through your actions. Extend grace to everyone. And whatever you do and wherever you go, let us all remember that uh, Jesus stops and takes notice of us wherever we may be. So may that shake us and change us so that we can then help Jesus change this world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.